I'm glad you're in here because it's sure getting crazy out there, isn't it? You wouldn't be a rational human being if you didn't ask from time to time, what on earth is going on in our world? It's strange, isn't there? Peculiar ironies. Political correctness is the rule of the day. You have to be careful what you say, and yet people have never treated each other worse than we treat each other today. In fact, hatred and horrors are happening like never before, and bullying of all kind at all ages is rampant. Rage is everywhere. I remember when people used to talk about those who carry guns as packing heat, and yet when I think about the term packing heat, I wonder how many normal-looking people that we encounter every day are walking around with rage. I mean, we see the stories all the time. I mean, just this week, there's the story of the man in Colorado. I think he's supposed to be arraigned tomorrow, but he killed his beautiful pregnant wife and killed his little girls, three and four, according to what the law enforcement says. And when I looked at the pictures of those little girls, I, I looked at them and I thought, I don't see how anybody could harm them, but especially their own dad. And yet, when you looked at that picture, they lived in a very normal looking house, a very normal looking family. Those kinds of stories years ago would have been the stories of the decade or maybe even the stories of the first half of the century. And yet, they barely are the story of the day, are they? Because the next day, there's going to be another tragic story. I've never seen a time where family members kill family members the way it's happening in our world today. I remember when I was nine years old, there was a guy named Charles Whitman who climbed up to the tower of the University of Texas and with a high-powered rifle picked off indiscriminately targets, just people walking down the street. It was the story of the decade. In fact, for years, for decades, people talked about the Texas University of Texas shooting. And yet, how many of you here today could remember all the mass shootings that just happened in the last 12 months? Could you remember the places? Could you remember the stories? No, we can't, can we? Because they happen with such rapidity that it's, it's as if it's just something that we have come to expect. But that's part of it. We have volatility in leadership. I've loved to study politics through the years. I'm not a political animal. I just love history. And I've studied world leaders, and I've studied geopolitics, and I've watched as leaders have come and gone, and there have been good leaders, bad leaders, weak leaders, but I've never seen such volatility when I look at the global landscape as we have, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And with the leaders that we have today, gone is any sense of dignity or decorum or equilibrium or self-control. We're embarrassed by what we see in our leaders today. World economies are fragile. I was just reading about a major economy in the world. It's not in our part of the world, but We're not sure that they're going to survive the next two weeks, but other economists were saying we don't know when a failing economy on the globe will be the string that gets pulled that causes the other economies to fall like dominoes. Because of technological advances, on a more practical note, because of technological advances, we have long-standing careers here in the United States that are evaporating. Hey, this is a simple one. You know about Uber and Lyft, but it's just wreaking havoc on cabbies in the United States. The taxi cab industry that has been around forever is just, just about to blow up and disappear. No one's blaming anyone. It's just technology. I was reading about a high rate of suicide among taxi cab drivers in New York City. For a long time, New York did not allow additional drivers. There was a set number of taxi cab drivers. So in order to have a taxi in New York, you had to buy a medallion. Somebody had to sell a medallion so you could have the right to be a taxi cab driver. And those medallions got more and more expensive through the years until they reached the $1 million point. And so taxi cab drivers would basically have to mortgage their lives away to buy one of these medallions in the hopes that after they had their career, they could sell their medallion and it would provide their, their income, their retirement. But because of Uber and Lyft, and other similar services, those medallions have dropped in prices, in price in some cases, to below $200,000. And there are taxi cab drivers that are committing suicide because they just can't face the reality of change. And who could blame them? But relationships, just human relationships, are frayed. I mean, just take, for instance, marriage. Nobody knows what marriage is anymore, or very few people do. What is marriage supposed to be? Why do you get married? What what is the meaning of marriage? Who can get married? All those things are up for grabs today. We live in an age where people just live together before marriage, sometimes living together two, three, four, five years, and then they decide to get married. But what does that marriage mean? What, What changes other than the fact that they've had a very, very expensive party? 
We live in a world where it isn't just men and woman relationships, but friend relationships and parent-child and child-parent relationships. Modern electronics and communication has made us believe that we're more connected, have more friends and more followers than ever, and yet we've never lived in a time where people felt more alone than today and we have the troubled mental health to show for it. I travel the country in just a little while. I'll be getting on a plane to go to Charlotte. I'm in one of the greatest churches in America tomorrow and, and speaking there. And I, as I travel, I listen to other leaders, not just from the faith field, but also from the mental health field. And I hear them saying the same thing. People have the sense of isolation more today than ever before. Personal privacy? Hey, forget about that. That's a thing of the past. I mean, we live in a world where cameras are everywhere, and beyond that, there's all kinds of electronic surveillance that monitors the products that you like, the products you buy, the products you're inclined to buy, the products that you're inclined to buy in specific times and situations of the year. Forget about personal privacy. When I was in middle school, I read George Orwell's 1984. George Orwell wrote about a dystopian future, wrote about it in the 40s. You will remember if you've read that book or if you've read about that book, you remember the mantra of 1984. It was Big Brother is watching you. I don't think Orwell had any idea what he was talking about. He was just guessing. But that's no longer a dystopian motto, is it? That's a world that you and I live in today. Personal privacy is gone. Forget about it. And we have a collapse of integrity. One thing that we've learned from the hashtag MeToo movement is that people that we've looked up to in the past had skeletons in the closet, figures that we saw that brought to us the morning news, that we looked at, we had comfort with these personalities as we looked at them and listened to them as they talked about life, people in the entertainment industry. But it isn't just that, it's well-known pastors, sports figures, political figures. I was just reading this week in Pennsylvania that there are 300 priests over a period of time who abused more than 1,000 children and religious leaders covered it up. And people are wondering, is there anyone that I can trust anymore? I'm not trying to be negative today. I'm just calling it as it is. You see what I see. I'm bringing up these issues, but there are a dozen more that I'm not going to bring up that you could bring up. There's a sense of hopelessness out there that's contributing to a high rate of suicide. I could bring statistics to you, but this is I realize this is totally anecdotal on my part. But I've been a pastor for over 40 years. I've conducted over 1,000 funerals, and yet I've never conducted as many funerals of suicide victims as I am today. There is this hopelessness. What does it all add up to? The world that you and I live in today, what, what, what is, what, what, what's, what's going to come in the future? I remember when I started preaching. In fact, the first time I preached a revival, I was 16 years old. And then when I would finish speaking, there would be a long queue of people to ask me questions about the Bible. As I think back on that, it's so bizarre that people would line up to ask a 16-year-old kid questions about the Bible. But I do remember that even back then, even when I first started preaching, one of the questions that people wanted to ask me was, do you believe that we're living in the last days? Last days? If I was an atheist, I would know we were living in the last days. If I didn't believe in God, I'd know we were living in the last days. Why? Why? Because this can't continue. I just want us to understand the world as we know it today is not sustainable. All of these issues that I've talked about, it cannot continue for any length of time because we are racing to oblivion at breakneck speed. Somebody will say, and this will probably be my personality, somebody will say, Mark, you're too gloomy. Things have always been this way. No, they haven't. But someone will say, Mark, things turn around. Things will turn around. I want to believe that too. But let me ask you a question in all academic honesty. Just what do you see on the horizon that's going to be the catalyst that turns this around? Is your hope in politics? Is your hope in media? Is your hope in the altruism of the people that are out there on the streets? Just what do you see as the catalyst that's going to turn this around? You know, there's a glaring irony in our world today. I mean... Technology just gets more and more perfect. Now, if you've just been on the phone with customer service, I, I, you may not see that, but I just I want you to think about the reality as we look at technology in the last 40 years, it gets more and more perfect. But instead of, us, instead of it making us better, it's just putting pressure on us as a human race and revealing that the technology isn't really helping us. It's just showing more and more that we're flawed, broken people that have a hard time prosecuting life. 
I don't think the question is what's going on out there. To me, the question is, is there any hope? I think about this not only as my own self with my wife. We are, we're not young anymore, but I think about it because I have kids and I have grandkids. And I look at the world as it is today and, and I, I wonder, I mean, some of you who are my age or even in the generation before me, you've seen a very different world. You've seen, like Paul Simon wrote years ago, you've seen the culture slip sliding away for a long period of time. And the question that we all have to ask is, is there any hope? Well, I have the, the wonderful responsibility of bringing good news to you today, and it's a joy for me to stand before you and say, yes, indeed, there is hope. There is a bright future to this world, and it, it's contained in four words that was made by a man who stood on the earth 2,000 years ago. His name was Jesus Christ, and it was the night he was about to be arrested. Then he talked to his followers, and he said to them, I'm going away, and then he gave them these four words, I will come again. If you ask me today, Why I have hope, I don't have any hope in Washington. I don't have any hope in Topeka. I respect those people who are in those places God commands me to. My hope is not in Hollywood. My hope is not in Madison Avenue or Wall Street. My hope is not in some other nation. My hope is in the fact that Jesus Christ, who came into our world 2,000 years ago, lived a perfect life, ran the table, laid that life on a Roman cross, hung between heaven and earth for six hours, paid the price for the dysfunction of this world, and then he went back to heaven When he said, I will come again, that's my hope. Now, somebody will say, well, Mark, what would that mean if Jesus came back? Well, it would mean hundreds of things. And we'll talk about some of those things, especially in week six and seven of this series. But right now, I just want to give you three verses from the Bible to show you what I mean by the fact my hope is in Jesus' statement, I will come again. Let me read this verse, Acts 3.20. God will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah, for he must remain in heaven until the time for final, file this word away, restoration of all things. And now, Acts 17, 31. For God has set a day for judging this world with, ready for word two, justice. By the man he has appointed and proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. And now the third verse, Revelation 21. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Now again, there are hundreds of things that are gonna happen when Jesus comes. We'll talk about those. But let's look at these three. First of all, the Bible says the restoration of all things. Have you noticed that this world doesn't work? It's broken. It was broken in the box. The the intellectual... C.S. Lewis said, if I have yearnings that are fulfilled in this world, then perhaps I was made for another world. And we were. See, when Jesus comes, the world will work for the first time the way it was meant to work. It'll be right side up. The second thing that we see is that when Jesus comes, there's going to be justice. In all the years of human history, one thing has been proven time and time again, regardless of the form of government, and that is that those who have the power have oppressed people who didn't have the power. And justice has been so elusive. But I assure you that when Jesus Christ comes back, there is going to be justice once and for all, finally and forever. There will be true justice for every man, every woman who lives when Jesus rules. And now the third thing. He said he would make everything new. No more tears, no more dying, no more crying, no more sorrow. Everything is new. I'm going to make some of you mad right now. I don't mean to. It's just that you love antiques and I don't. From time to time, my wife has taken me into an antique store. Hey, listen, between you and me, it looks like a garage sale with walls. Antiques, just old junk. I like new stuff, you know. Don't tell me George Washington slept here. Just change the sheets and buy a new bed. I just... Could care less about antiques. I like new things. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes, things are going to be new. It's not, gonna, it's not, I mean, maybe there will be antiques. I don't know. Some of you love antiques. The Lord loves you too, and he will have those, but not for me. When Jesus comes, restoration, justice, and everything new. But when? Come back next week, and I'll tell you. No. <laughs> we will talk about that. Next week, we have a message called God's Clock. But I don't know when Jesus is coming back for sure, specifically. I mean, somebody could say, is it possible that it will be in our lifetime? Will it happen before all the wheels fall off? Fortunately, we have an amazing book, and we're going to talk about that today. 
26% of your Bible is prophecy, not prediction. Hey, there are a lot of sources that predict. If you were to look at my nightstand, nightstand beside my bed, I have a lot of copies of Harvard Business Review and Wall Street Journal and, and, and Forbes and Fortune. Now, I don't have any money, but I like to think about, study about people that do. And I'm interested. All those things have predictions. I turn on my favorite channel on television, which is the NFL Network. They make predictions on there. Predictions are about analysis and projection. Prophecy is different. See, prophecy is the one who knows the future, tells what he knows, and then the people he tells know the future. Prophecy is very different. And 26% of your Bible is God telling the future. And for the next six weeks, we're diving in, and we're going to learn about the future. Now, somebody could say, and I want to tackle this real quickly. Somebody could say, well, Mark, I've been to church before, and I heard him talk about prophecy, and it just weirded me out. I mean, there was a guy that talked about the rapture and tribulation and the Antichrist and Armageddon, and it just freaked me out. Hey, I get it. I get it. I grew up a pastor's kid. I heard about prophecy when I was a kid growing up. And frankly, the message I got from those preachers back in that day is that weird stuff is going to happen at the end, and you should be totally scared to death. <clears throat> From the very beginning, when I began to pray and think about this series, my goal was this. I don't want to just give you stuff that's going to happen at the end so that you'll think of it as some sort of weird set of events that are extraneous that are going to happen unrelated to the rest of the world. I want us to understand that what happens at the end is the culmination of a long narrative. And unless we understand that, it won't make any sense. See, there's no way that you can understand Revelation without understanding that it's the culmination of a clash of dynasties. Let me make four statements that are going to follow a flight plan for this series. Here they are. Number one, there is a clash of dynasties, and end-time prophecy is just the final scene of that clash. Number two, that means it's not the end of the world, it's just the end of the battle. Number three, that means it's the beginning of the winning dynasty. And number four, those who are on the winning side aren't headed for the end, they're moving to the beginning of things forever being the way they were meant to be. So with that in mind, that flight plan today, I just want to spend the next 15 or 20 minutes talking about two things. We have said that the events of the end times are the culmination of a long-standing clash of dynasties. What do we mean by clash of dynasties? When you open the Bible on page one, you, you meet God as creator the Bible tells us that God created the world. I have a lot of friends who are non-theists. In fact, I've done talks at secular universities and interacted with, with friends, and I know they have a little bit of agenda. And it's, it's a strange thing, and I'll tell you this before. All Christians think they have the coup de grace question to stop non-theists, and all non-theists think they have the coup de grace question to stop Christians. It's not true. I assure you, non-theists have heard all the stuff that Christians come up with, and Christians have heard all the stuff that non-theists come up with. But I, I've been asked these questions that are sort of shut down questions. And one of those shut down questions is this. Why did God create a world where wrong and sin was possible? And that's, that's sort of meant to be a, a closed in question to suggest that if God is everything that the Bible teaches he is, that he wouldn't create a world where people had the potential of doing wrong. Ravi Zacharias answers this question a lot better than I can. He said, if you think about a creator God creating a world, he only has four possibilities for the kind of world that it could be. The first kind of world would be a world in which he creates nothing. The second model would be he creates a world where there is no good and no evil. It is an immoral or amoral world. The third possibility is he creates a world where everyone has to do good. And the fourth possibility is he creates a world in which people have the choice to do either good Good, that which is like God, or the choice to do that which is not like God. And Zechariah said it right when he said, love is only possible in the fourth model. If you look at the first three models, there is no such thing as love. There can't be. It's vacuous. So when you think about God and how much he values love, that is why he always creates his beings to have a moral choice between that which is good and that which is evil. Well, long before he created the world with human beings, he created angels, this is a pet peeve of mine. I don't mean to get on the soapbox here, but could I just say to all of us, please don't tell your children that when grandma dies, that grandma is turned into an angel. She is not an angel. Angels are servants. We're meant to be sons and daughters of God, okay? When Jesus came back, he didn't say, see my wings. 
He said, look at my hands and feet. So, I, and again, it's just a pet peeve of mine. I, it's so, you know, if you tell your kids that they're going to turn into angels, it's okay. It's just wrong, but it's okay. <laughs> Listen, if I had a nickel for every silly thing that's been said in church, I'd be a rich man, so I'm not blaming anybody. But here's the deal. Long before God created us, he created the angels. They were meant to be servants, but he created them with a free will. The most beautiful of the angels was an angel named Lucifer. He was the one who was responsible for leading worship in heaven. But having free will, he got a little tired of God getting all the props. So he said, why should God get all the worship? I'm pretty beautiful myself. I think I should just be on an equal plane with God. Now, we read about this. It's in several places in the Old Testament, but one of the best places is in Isaiah chapter 14. And so the Bible presents the story of what took place in heaven before the world was created between Lucifer, Satan, and God. Now here's the question. How great is your fall from heaven, O shining one, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the earth, low among the dead bodies? For you said in your heart, I will go up to heaven. I will make my seat higher than the stars. That's a reference to angels. Higher than the stars of God. I will take my place on the mountain of the meeting place of the gods in the inmost parts of the north. I will go higher than the clouds. I will be like the most high. Remember when Satan talked to Eve, he said, you can be like God. He's just trying to infect her with his disease. But you will come down to the underworld, even to its inmost parts. Those who see you will be looking on you with care. They will be in deep thought saying, is this the troubler of the earth, the shaker of the kingdoms? So basically Satan said, I will be like God. And God said, no, you won't. Thumped him out. Hey, Jesus, remember this, Jesus didn't begin in Bethlehem. He was God who came into our world. Jesus would say this to his audience in Luke 10. I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Jesus was saying, I saw it. I was there. When he was thumped out of heaven, Jesus said, I saw it happen. But here's what you must understand, and Revelation 12, 4 makes this plain, and we'll talk about it again when we start talking about the tribulation period. The Bible tells us that when Satan rebelled against God, one-third of the angels joined his insurrection. So when you ask the question, what are demons, that would be it. One-third of the angels said, hey, it sounds good to us. And God said, not just Satan, but all the demons, you're thumped out of heaven as well. So we're talking about clash of dynasties. It starts to take a little shape, doesn't it? You have God and his kingdom, but now you see the second kingdom. This, this dynasty now, headed by this rogue angel and the third of the angels who decided they would go with him. But how does it affect us? Roll forward time. God decides to create a family. He wants you and me. He wants sons and daughters. So he puts the first human beings on the planet, Adam and Eve. And here's something that we don't get taught enough in church. He surrendered kingdom authority over to them. He basically said, look at this, this is in Genesis 1 and 2. He said, rule, I, I'm, I'm giving you the title deed to the earth. But along comes Satan and he swindles Adam and Eve out of their destiny and they basically, they, and this is what can't be missed, they basically turn kingdom authority over to him. And now legitimately, legally, Satan owns planet earth. <laughs> Do you remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan? And Satan came to Jesus on the third temptation and said, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. He said, hey, they're turned over to me. I mean, he knew Jesus well enough to know he can't blow smoke at Jesus. I mean, he is making a factual statement at that moment. If you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. You won't have to die on a cross. If you just do things my way, I'll turn them all over to you. But he didn't, did he? He went about it the hard way, and he did what he was destined to do. See, you and I could not win back this earth because we're sinners ourselves. We're descendants of Adam and Eve, and so God came in skin and did what we couldn't do, and as I said, he ran the table for 33 years, hung on a Roman cross, paid for all our dysfunction, and when he stepped out of the grave the way God looked at it, he had the authority one more time to own the earth and the future and our destiny. It's pretty cool. Somebody will say, well, I don't understand. If he came out of the grave with the power, why, did, why, why didn't it just end right there? I don't want to embarrass us today, but I mean, I, I thought about asking you the question. I won't do this, but I started to ask you, how many of you have accepted Christ since Jesus arose from the grave? It would be like all of us, wouldn't it? That's why. That's why God is waiting. 
There are just more people to join the dynasty. And so we live in a world today where there's a clash of dynasties. Do you feel that? I mean, you and I live in a world where we see the brokenness and the dysfunction and the pain and the horror. And yet, on the other hand, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're one of his daughters, if you're one of God's daughters or one of God's sons, you have a sense of hope because there are two dynasties. When I was eight years old in the playground of my school in Fort Worth, Texas, I'd been over a water fountain and I asked to join Jesus' dynasty and I'm with him today and I'm with him tomorrow and I'm with him forever. Clash of dynasties. Well, what's next? I want to do something with the time that we have left here and I want to tackle the question, how do we know that the Bible is an authoritative source for the future? If we're diving into the Bible for the next six weeks for the future, I mean, how do we know that it's an authoritative source? For one thing, you and I are surrounded by authoritative sources and they conflict each other. I mean, I mean, we read about what's supposed to be healthy for us and what's not supposed to be healthy for us. We're not talking about the future necessarily. We're talking about medical science today, stuff that's in medical journals. I don't know whether eggs are good for you or they kill you. I mean, is meat good for you or is it bad for you? I mean, you get experts to say everything today. So if we can't even be sure what's authoritative for the world that we're living in currently, how can we know that there's any source that's authoritative for the future? Hey, you want to have some fun for the next few moments that we have together? This is just an introduction sermon. We really don't even get started in the series till next week. That's God's clock. By the way, you can't miss a single week. We're actually taking a break for Labor Day weekend because I don't want anybody to miss any of these talks. You need them all. They're all components. So let's do something for this, the rest of this introduction message. Let's look at, I want us to look at five places in the Bible where the writers wrote something that they could have had no science to understand that they were writing something correct. In fact, I think several of these situations, the writers didn't even have the first clue what they were writing. But these are guys that wrote things. They called the future before it happened. Let's take the simplest and maybe even the most controversial. That the earth is round. Hey, all kinds of stuff has been believed about the earth, but primarily the earliest civilizations believed that the earth was flat. A lot of them believed that there were pillars that held it up. There were, the Egyptians believed that it was on the back of a giant turtle. There were those who believed it was a flat disk floating in the sea. But 750 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words, God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to them. To him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and he makes his tent from them. You might not know this, but the earliest written Old Testament book, or the earliest written book in the Bible is the book of Job. We're not even sure what the date of it is. We just know it's the most ancient book. And yet Job wrote in Job 26, 7, God stretches out the northern sky over empty space, and he hangs the earth on nothing. Well, this causes skeptics to have a hissy fit, and they all become Hebrew scholars at that point. And they say circle doesn't really mean globe. And I'll be the first to admit you Read to you, ancient Hebrew is a nebulous language. So since that causes, like I say, the skeptics to have a hissy fit, we'll just set that one aside for the moment, okay? Let's go to something really substantial. You don't have to go very far in the Bible. In fact, the first two chapters for the Bible to tell us that we all go back to a single man and a single woman. The Bible tells us that we go back to Adam and Eve. We all go back to one man and we all go back to woman. We, one woman. We all share what science would call a most recent common ancestor, an MRCA. Well, the fact of the matter is, that hasn't always been believed because when you look at how different we appear to be in different parts of the world, there have been those who said, oh, we all come from different ancestors. But DNA brought us a lot of understanding. When Watson and Crick discovered that long molecule, everything changed. I've had so much fun with DNA through the years because it's just wreaked havoc on Darwinism. And especially on this, because as we begin to understand the ramifications of DNA, in 1987, it was discovered scientifically and written in the journals that it had been discovered that we all go back to the same woman. An MRCA, most recent common answer. So we all go back, and scientists regretted immediately how they dubbed this woman. They called her mitochondrial Eve 
Well, that was in 1987. It was discovered we all go back to the same woman. In 1995, it was discovered that we all go back to the same male. He was called chromosomal Adam. The big science was real quick to tell us they didn't live at the same time. You know, it couldn't be Adam and Eve. So consequently, there's got to be a gap between them. So the date for, uh, for mitochondrial Eve was 200,000 B.C. And the date for chromosomal Adam was 237,000 B.C. You've got to have that 37,000-year gap. 237,000 B.C. to 581,000 B.C., somewhere in there. Okay. Well, we all go back to the same ancestor, male and female, but it could not be as the Bible states. But just this year, on May 14th of this year, scientist Mark Steckel at Rockefeller University in, in New York City and, and David Thaler at University of Basel in Switzerland pub, published in the journal Human Evolution their compilation of research. They had researched 5 million gene snapshots that they dubbed DNA barcodes collected from 100,000 animal species by hundreds of researchers around the world deposited in the United States government-run gym bank. And here's what they discovered. Nine out of 10 species on earth today, including humans, came into being 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Now that just wreaks havoc on Darwinism on a primary level. We'll talk about that sometime. But now we're down to 100,000. We've gone from 200,000 for, um, uh, for mitochondrial leave, 237,000 to 581,000 for chromosomal atom. Now we're down to 100,000, maybe a ceiling of 200,000. But along come MIT's D.L. Road, scientists and author Steve Olson and Yale's Joseph Chang, especially Joseph Chang from Yale. And they began to look at the mathematical ramifications of DNA, and they published their analysis, and here is what they published. If you go back 5,000 to 7,000 years ago, everybody has exactly the same set of ancestors. I know Wikipedia is not authoritative, but they're pretty good at getting to bottom line sometimes. There's an interesting statement. If you look at the MRCA, most recent common ancestor page on Wikipedia, it's got this, and I'm quoting, the age of the human MRCA is unknown, estimated at around 200,000 years, and it may be as recent as 3,000 years ago. <laughs> you ever get tired of the silliness? You, here's the thing. You say, well, Mark... Science, science has disproven creation. No, 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 science won't, won't entertain creation. Science basically rules out creation as a discovery. In fact, any discussion of creation is, in, their, in that nomenclature, religious. So therefore, creation can never be part of the discussion. It's like if you're trying to scientifically figure out which closet in your house a pair of your shoes are in, but you rule out the closet that your shoes are actually in, you have to build a science around all of the other closets. And you can put in all kinds of facts. People put shoes in closets. People put shoes in the closet that look like my shoes. There are other shoes in the closet. I mean, you get a whole science, but the problem is you're not going to find your shoes because you're not looking in the closet where your shoes are. <laughs> you know, every once in a while people say, Bible-believing Christians don't love science. I love science. I'll tell you what I love. I love fact. See, everything has to bow to fact. Science has to bow to fact. Mathematics has to bow to fact. Medicine has to bow to fact. Religion has to bow to fact. Love fact. I'm just saying that the Bible wrote years, 4,000 years ago at least, that we all go back to the same common ancestor, and we don't, even, we don't even know that scientifically until 1987, 1995, and we're just now learning when that most recent common ancestor lived. Well, let's go to another one. And this one's already been proven by the previous, but I'll just go ahead and throw it in. We all come from one blood. That wasn't always believed either, was it? But now, because of what I've just said, it's very clear that we all go back to one blood. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul stood on Mars Hill and talked to the intelligentsia of his day, and he said to them, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Well, we know that's true scientifically now. I love this article. It's an AP release, July 5th, 2006. This article said it also means that all of us have ancestors of every color and creed. Every Palestinian suicide bomber has Jews in his past. Every Sunni Muslim in Iraq is descended from at least one Shiite. And every Klansman's family has African roots. True. We know it now. 
2,000 years ago. A man who didn't have any of the microbiological sciences that we have today stood on a mountain in Athens and said, we all come from one blood. Oh, let's move into prophecy. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that when the Antichrist sets up his regime, that no one will be able to buy or sell without a mark. This is in Revelation 13, 16. He, the Antichrist, required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or the forehead, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark. (laughs) Hey, I grew up a little contrary and a little skeptical when I was a kid. My dad was a pastor. I remember the day he preached the sermon on this. I know exactly where I was sitting in the worship center. I think I was like nine. And dad was preaching that verse, and I thought to myself, I don't believe that. I thought, I I know all about the black market, and you can't stop people from buying and selling. You know, people have cash behind the building and and that kind of thing. And I sat back there, and I thought, there's no way. But that was before the cashless society and electronic transactions, wasn't it? Today, the technology makes this prophecy passe especially with electronic commerce and cloud computing companies. I mean, we even understand that this may not be a government restriction. It could be the restriction of private companies. Just this year, in May of this year, the largest of these electronic commerce and cloud computing companies, I will not name it except to say that my wife loves this company because we have boxes on our porch every day. (laughs) Mary Alice doesn't like to shop. She just clicks. So I'm not naming this company, but in May of this year, the largest of these companies banned certain customers from buying on their site because of too many returns. I don't blame them for that. I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. But it's a small jump from that to stopping people from buying or selling because you don't like their politics. That's already happening with certain social media organs or because you don't like their religion. That's a discussion for another message. I just want to point out to you that John sat in a cold rock pile in the Aegean Sea, and he wrote and said that in the last days, nobody is going to be able to buy or sell without a mark. And the fulfillment of that prophecy is as recent as tomorrow. Let me give you one more, and I'm finished. And that is that when Jesus comes, every eye will see him. This has been one of the most puzzling prophecies to people, to Bible scholars throughout the centuries. How in the world, when Jesus comes, would every eye be able to see him? See, John is writing this, on the, and he's like 90 years old. John was there on the day that Jesus took them outside the city of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, and he ascended into heaven. John was there, and the angels said, hey, he will come back just like he went into heaven. John understood that nobody saw him go except those in that neighborhood. And he knows that he's coming back like he went up, but now the Holy Spirit has John write something bizarre. That when he comes back, it won't just be people in the neighborhood who see him, but every eye will see him. Well, let's take that apart. When Jesus came, if you go back into the mindset of the first century, just how is every eye going to see him? I mean, there would have to be some way for it to be widespread, to be viewed, well, the first primitive, primitive usage of motion picture was in 1877, so that means for nearly 1,900 years, there would have been no way to have captured the image of Jesus returning. Television was invented in 1927. It wasn't, from, it wasn't common until the 1950s. But even if it could be shown on television, half the world would be asleep. So how's the half of the world that's going to be asleep see it if they're not able to see it happen in real time? Well, video recorders went on sale in 1971. If you're a baby boomer, you remember they became popular in the 80s. But you don't have satellite broadcasting really until the latter part of the 20th century. And the internet wasn't widespread until the mid-90s and smartphones didn't really take off till 2007. You know the weird thing? Is if I told you that when Jesus comes, every eye will see him? Of course. Duh. I'll just watch him on my smartphone. And I'll catch him on my Apple Watch. See what I mean? 
My, my favorite Bible writer was a commentator named Harry Ironside. Harry died in 1951. And when he wrote about this text, Every Eye Will See Him, here's what he wrote. By a stupendous miracle, every eye will see him. As recently as the 40s, Harry Ironside looked at that and didn't see anywhere in the world it could happen. And you and I don't even blink. My, my question is this. How does a man, 90 years old, banished to a cold rock pile in the Aegean Sea, how does he sit there and know that when Jesus does come back, every eye will see him? It's because the Bible makes prophecies. It doesn't make predictions. The one who knows the future tells the future, so the people he told know the future too. If you hold a Bible in your lap, 26% of it is prophecy. There are over 1,800 prophecies. In fact, I love Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 and 9, because in these two verses, God describes what he does. He said, I'm the Lord. That's my name. That's my calling card. I'm the boss. I'm the Lord. I will not give my glory to anyone else. Everything I prophesied has come true, and now I will prophesy again. I love these words. I will tell you the future before it happens. Dr. Peter Stoner was the head of the mathematics and astronomy department at Pasadena City College. He was a genius mathematician. He pulled together a collection of his students that were also genius mathematicians. And he said, I want, to, I want you to engage with me in a study. And he looked at the prophecies about Jesus, and not, not the prophecies of his second return, but the prophecies of his first return. And there are a number of prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. That's why you have people like Simeon and Anna waiting for him. They're, they're, they're looking at the prophecies. You remember when Herod wanted to know where the Messiah was going to be born, he called in his religious experts, and they said, in Bethlehem. That's because 500 years before Jesus was born, Micah said, you'd be born in Bethlehem. So there are a number of these prophecies. And so Dr. Stoner had his students look at just eight of these prophecies. What would be the likelihood, what would be the mathematical likelihood of all these prophecies being fulfilled in one person? And after their analysis, they determined that it would be one in 10 to the 17th power. In order to give the rest of us who are not mathematicians and geniuses like Dr. Stoner and his team, in order to give us some sense of what that would be like, he said, you could take the state of Texas, cover it with silver dollars, two feet deep. You could mark a silver dollar, place it somewhere in the state of Texas, blindfold a man, let him walk anywhere he wanted to walk in the state of Texas, and the likelihood of all these prophecies coming true in one person would be like the blind man walking through the state of Texas in silver dollars two feet deep, or a blindfolded person reaching down and picking the correct silver dollar. Yeah, just eight prophecies, one in 10 to the 17th power. When they got to 42 of the prophecies, they said it's one in 10 to the 145th power. But there weren't eight prophecies, and there weren't 42. There were 108. You see what God is saying? He's saying, everything I've said has come true, and I'll tell you the future before it happens. Well, someone will say, Mark, surely you recognize not everyone's going to buy into this. Yeah, I, I get that. I was born at night, just not last night. I really was born at night. I know. I just know this. You got to put a bet down. You know, I talk to people like, well, I don't know. Maybe this is true. Maybe this. At some point, you got to put a bet down on the table. And not a bet of money. You got to bet your soul. You're going to put your soul on the table sometime. You say, I don't believe there's a God. I believe it's all we are is dust in the wind. I believe when you die, it's all over. Okay, put your bet down. That's your bet. You risk, you bet. Put your bet on that. Someone will say, well, I just bet the human race is somehow going to figure it out and get better and better. Okay, put your bet on the table. Bet your soul. I know not everybody's going to get it or agree with it. I'm just telling you that when I was eight years old, I put my bet on the table. I bet everything on Jesus, and I'm cool with my bad. And it's not a blind, just for anyone who's listening today, it's not a blind faith bet. I love evidence. I'll put my evidence on the table every day and twice on Sunday. I'm cool with my bad. I'm cool with my bad. 
And not only that, I see it happening before my eyes. Everything that God said is going to happen is happening right now. And watch and see over the next six weeks if you don't see it too. As I look at the world today, it looks bad, it looks bleak, it looks dark, it looks cloudy. But when I look at the future, it is as bright as Jesus Christ himself. Because 2,000 years ago, the man said, I will come again. And when he comes back, he's bringing justice, he's bringing restoration, and he's making everything new. Somebody will say, well, Mark, I want to put my bet down today. Well, I want to give you a chance to do that. The good news is to join Jesus' dynasty. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to do community service. You just got to pick a king. And outside of that, it's free. He paid for it on the cross. He said, ask. And if you would like to pray to invite Jesus Christ to become your king today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. These aren't magic words, but you can join me. I'll say them slowly, and you can decide if you want to own them personally. You ready? Let's pray. Dear God, I am a sinner. I'm flawed and broken. But I believe you love me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he, believe he arose from the grave. I want him for my king. I want to be part of your everlasting dynasty. Thank you for forgiving me and making me your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, real quick, real quick. If you just pray with me, I have a gift box. There's some awesome stuff in this gift box. It won't cost you anything. Nobody will hassle you. Just go to any info center, and all you got to say is, I pray with Mark, and they will give this to you today. You can take it home with you. There's a Bible like I preach from, a book I wrote, some cool stuff that will help you understand your decision better. Just go to any info center and say, I pray with Mark. Next week, we'll pick this up again with a message called God's Clock. See you then.